Fire breaks out aboard a ship loaded with hazardous cargo. Docked in an area dense with oil refineries and industrial chemicals. Another explosion. The sky. You have just heard it. We are bending down. The sky is like broad daylight. Something's like picked up the house and shook it. Just shook it and then put it back down. A small Texas town left in ruins. It was just pandemonium and everything was on fire that you can imagine. See, it was just like a war. That's what it was. And I said, my goodness, what has happened? I asked the Lord, if I can't get out, please let me die in peace and not lay here any longer. The town of Texas City, Texas, was built on the back of its chemical industry. Plants and refineries dominate the waterfront. Raw materials taken from the earth are transformed into chemicals that are unknown in nature. These materials are amazingly versatile and are vital to society, but if recklessly handled, they can exact their terrifying revenge. In Texas City, they know this fact all too well. The mishandling of a dangerous chemical triggered their darkest day. An epic disaster unknown to many Americans, but forever ingrained in the minds of its survivors. Forty miles south of Houston, Texas City is one of the busiest ports in the nation, and its chemical industry is a major reason why. This industry has its roots in the Second World War. The military needed chemicals, and the town geared up to provide them. In the process, its population tripled, reaching nearly 18,000. That's when the town changed so much, so fast. All the refineries that were here upgraded, became larger, new ones came in and joined them. People came in, there wasn't a bedroom that wasn't rented out. There was a time of tremendous growth. Jobs in the chemical plants were plentiful, but the hours were long. We were working six days a week. At that time, you couldn't buy a car. There were no houses available. It was really a very difficult time. But as young people, we still had a good time. I worked in the laboratory at Monsanto. My sister worked there too, and would be walking through the plant and somebody would go, <laughs> she'd turn around and say, thank you. <laughs> uh, but when my husband came home from the service, he did not want me working. So I quit my job and I was home. At war's end in 1945, Texas City switched gears and began looking forward to peacetime prosperity. Returning servicemen had little trouble finding work as stevedores and pipe fitters, chemists and surveyors. I was discharged on a Thursday and I went to work on Monday. Uh, of course, it was for 80 cents an hour and a job I didn't even know, but uh, Anyway, I had a job. Chemicals were revolutionizing America's industry, and Texas City was at the forefront. This is the age of industrial chemistry. It has attained importance undreamed of just a few years ago. All around us are the products of modern chemistry. Window shades, draperies. Chemicals had done a lot to win World War II. Better living through chemistry was a, was a big theme at the time. In this new world of industrial chemistry, the horizon is unlimited. The industrial chemist, the pioneer of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
By 1947, Texas City's future looked bright indeed. Its petrochemical plants were working around the clock. Its docks were handling about 4,000 ships a year. On April 11th, a French-owned cargo ship, the SS Grand Comp, entered the port of Texas City and docked at Pier O. There, longshoremen began loading her with 100-pound bags of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. It was bound for France, where the chemicals would help revitalize war-torn farmlands. Since the end of the war, about 75,000 tons of ammonium nitrate had passed through the Texas City docks. All the bags were labeled fertilizer. This told only part of the story. During the war, it had been mixed with TNT to make bombs. Longshoremen like Kiri Johnson worked with ammonium nitrate on a regular basis, but no one ever told them it could be hazardous. I didn't know all that much about it. I thought it was just only a, a fertilizer, but you fertilize for, as a farmer. I didn't know it was no dangerous outfit. I didn't know nothing about it. At 8 a.m. on April 16, 1947, longshoremen gathered as usual on Dock Road. Every morning, workers waited there for the foreman to choose which men would work on which ship for the day. As the men chosen to work on the Grand Comp descended into cargo hold four, one of them smelled smoke. A quick search revealed the source, a small fire in the bags of fertilizer stacked in the hold. Fires like this were usually put out quickly. The men tried to douse the fire with jugs of drinking water. It didn't work. At about 8.20 a.m., the ship's whistle sounded an alert. Then the crew brought a soda ash extinguisher in, and that didn't do any good. And then they lowered a hose into the number four hold with the intention of putting this on the fire. But the ship's French captain halted their effort. He didn't want his valuable cargo damaged by the water. His solution was to batten down the hatches, close all the ports, and turn on the steam smothering system in order to deprive the hold of oxygen and put out the fire that way. But this only made the fire burn hotter. Along with the 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate, the Grand Comp was loaded with 16 cases of small arms ammunition. It was the ammunition that began to worry many of the longshoremen. Ten minutes after the first alert, pressure created by the fire blew the hatch off hold four. The brilliant orange smoke was so thick that the Grand Comp's captain was forced to give the order to abandon ship. Drawn by the smoke, a sailor brought his camera over and took these photos of the fire's early stages. Texas City's first alarm whistle sounded at 8.33 a.m. 27 members of the town's volunteer fire department quickly answered the call. Water sprayed from their hoses vaporized as soon as it hit the ship's superheated deck. Firefighters were no longer battling to save the ship but to stop the flames from spreading to the docks. Meanwhile, hundreds of curious onlookers began to gather on the waterfront, drawn by the strange orange smoke. Some even brought their home movie cameras. At Texas City Central High School, senior Lucy Garcia was finding it hard to concentrate on her final bookkeeping exam. Her classroom was only a mile away from the burning Grand Comp. 
It was just real beautiful orange fire coming out of there, like a big ball. We looked out the window, and all the football players were getting into cars. And we stood by the window, and the teacher led us. You know, we said, oh, can't we go? Everybody's going to see that fire. And she said, no, y'all have to finish your exam. Jim Fuller was one of the students Lucy saw heading down to the docks. It was attractive, and uh, <laughs> first thing I know, there are eight of us jumping in that old car heading down there to check it out. At the waterfront, rumors circulated through the crowd that there was ammunition on board which might explode. Onlookers kept what they considered to be a safe distance from the burning ship, about a thousand feet. It would not be far enough. Back in a moment with Explosions, Texas City, here on the History Channel. Now back with more Explosions, Texas City. On the morning of April 16, 1947, as the French cargo ship SS Grand Comp burned out of control, hundreds of spectators gathered near the docks in Texas City, Texas. Workers from nearby industrial plants were also watching the fire. At the Monsanto chemical complex, just 600 feet from the burning ship, assistant plant manager Robert Morris tried to figure out just what was going on. We had no knowledge officially of what was on the ship. We concluded it was ammonium nitrate and we talked about it and um, decided that based on our collective experience it would not detonate but it would burn. Not everyone was so confident. I have a strong intuition of things and I felt uneasy. We couldn't get hardly get started with work early that morning for some reason. And after a while, the girls all came down, and they wanted me to go walking with them to go see the fire. And I said, no, it, that fire fr uh, frightens me. I, I don't want to go down there. High school senior Jim Fuller was getting nervous about cutting class to watch the fire. I decided I better get back to school because I had not ever played hooky, and I was a little, I didn't want to get in trouble. so. I chickened out and headed back. Well, in fact, we all did. Back at Monsanto, Robert Morris wondered why the fire still wasn't under control. He jumped into a company jeep and headed toward the docks to find out for himself. By now, hundreds more Texas City residents were on the scene. Longshoremen like Kiri Johnson were ordered off the ships Unhappy about missing a day's pay, the men hoped firefighters would put out the blaze quickly. We figured if they come down and put the fire, get the fire out, they might be able to go back to work. Then, at 9.12 a.m., as almost 500 spectators looked on, the SS Grand Comp exploded. watching the ship. I was driving south and I was watching the ship over to my left a little bit when it blew. It was a hell of a blast. The ship's cargo of a supposedly harmless chemical had detonated, taking everyone by surprise. I saw the white and yellow and red streaks going up real high at the top with little black stuff. Something's like picked up the house and shook it just shook it and then put it back down. I mean, it was quite a while. It was a long, about, I don't know how many minutes, but it was, it was terrifying. The explosion was heard over 100 miles away. Two small planes that had been circling 1,500 feet above were blown out of the sky 
killing both pilots on impact. Robert Morris and his Jeep were hurled into the air by the force of the blast. I put the brakes on, then I realized the Jeep was flying. So I carefully turned the key off, and I dove out the right side while we were still in the air. About this time, we had a parked car. Then, a 15-foot wall of water created by the blast crashed down onto the Texas City waterfront. Trapped under his Jeep, Morris was about to drown. So I must have been under maybe 30, 45 seconds, something like that. I finally, literally lifted the Jeep off of me going out under, under the back axle. Jim Fuller and his high school friends were walking back to their car when the blast knocked them down. I never really heard the explosion. Next thing I knew, I was being blown along the ground. I don't remember falling, but I remember being abrased along the ground. The nearby Monsanto complex was demolished. The explosion confirmed the suspicions of one of the company's senior chemists. I thought, my God, it was a nitrate fire. Everyone's reaction was the same. Whether you were standing or sitting, you were instantly on the floor or on the ground from the tremendous earth shock that came from the detonation. And no one in their wildest imagination can imagine how terrible all this was. Roofs caved in, covering Monsanto's employees with plaster and asbestos. Many, like Mary Hunter, were riddled with the glass from the windows. My arm was really like hamburger. There was just nothing there. Evidently, I did this and was turned, you know, thrown around. And so the glass went all into my back. In that one instant, hundreds were killed, thousands wounded. Shocked to still be alive, high school student Jim Fuller started to run. It's what you call scrambling. <laughs> you know, it's panic time. And so we made a mad dash, and that's when we saw some bad scenes. One car had a piece of steel had come through and decapitated two of the occupants. It was just pandemonium, and everything was on fire that you can imagine. It was awful. After crawling out from under his Jeep, Robert Morris's first thought was the safety of his workers. I turned toward the plant, and all I could see was wreckage. Went into the office and started pulling people out of the wreckage. So I helped several other people, Mary Hunter being one of them. We helped her out. Mary was battling to stay conscious when Morris found her. I'd wake up and then I'd pass out again. And then the next time I woke up, and I don't know how long it was or anything, um, Robert Morris was uh, carrying me out the front steps. I carried her as long as I could, and I said, Mary, I can't carry any farther. We saw her car. She said, look at my car, and I said, Mary, look at my plant. And of course, it was burning pretty good by then. Those in town who had survived the blast rushed to the scene to look for loved ones and to see if they could help. Along with most of the spectators, the 27 Texas City Volunteer Firefighters 